So if the morning session uh, was a historical perspective on the works in this exhibition, then this afternoon is a view from today. And uh, we have with us a trio of distinguished artists uh, who are working in the medium today to talk about the legacy of uh, the work in the exhibition, its impact, as well as um, kind of to take a, uh, uh, the pulse of the state of working in ceramics today. Um, I, as by way of introduction, I, I have uh, some slides of the artist's work so that you have a sense of, of, uh, of, of what their work is like and uh, the perspective from which they're, they're coming. Um, so we have, uh, we're delighted to have with us today Nicole Cherubini. Nicole is an artist based in Brooklyn, New York. Um, she just opened a brand new show at uh, Tracy Williams Limited, um, uh, which includes uh, a number of works that engage um, ceramics in uh, a new and inventive ways. Um, they incorporate uh, ceramic objects in um, multimedia assemblages um, that go uh, beyond traditional ceramics but still um, touch upon um, uh, and uh, expand upon the vocabulary of the ceramic tradition. Nicole uses techniques of ornamentation, assemblage, and coiling to create works that meld the visual aesthetic of high art with that of the utilitarian object, incorporating unexpected materials such as chain link, wood, tufts of fur, and fragments of glass. Cherubini creates works that often reference traditional art historical uses of clay, such as vessels or vases, but which simultaneously overturn those conceits. Uh, Cherubini's work has been exhibited at notable institutions such as the Santa Monica Museum of Art, the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia, and the Studio Museum in Harlem, and also MoMA PS1, among others. Uh, also on our panel today, we're pleased to have with us Ginger Geyer. Ginger, um, many of you may know because she uh, lived here in Dallas and worked at the Dallas Museum of Art uh, for many years. Um, and uh, Ginger um, earned her BFA and MFA degrees from Southern Methodist University and then worked for 13 years at the Kimball and the Dallas Museum of Art in conservation, collection management, and planning. Um, she received a Master of Arts in uh, pastoral ministry from the Episcopal Theological Seminary of the Southwest. And she has also been an adjunct professor there and at Concordia University. Um, Ginger's work is, uh, is uh, an, an as astonishing as uh, ceramics, as far as ceramics go. Uh, Ginger makes porcelain. Um, so what you're looking at is, um, is a glazed, porcelain, glazed and painted porcelain object. Um, much of her work touches on um, art history, on theology, on politics. And, and again, what you're looking at is porcelain. <laughs> and many of the works derive from um, uh, uh, an imaginary, rambunctious girl named Clora. And as you see here, these often incorporate not only um, everyday utilitarian objects, such as the vacuum, but also um, works of, of uh, art historical import, such as Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon down there, and these beautiful kind of brocaded fabrics for the, 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 the sack of the, the vacuum cleaner. And again, everything on the screen is porcelain. <laughs> Um, our third panelist today is Brian Melanfi, who, who many of you know as uh, the uh, Associate Professor uh, for Ceramics at Southern Methodist University. Um, upon completion of uh, ceramics MFA degree, he was awarded a Fulbright Fellowship to study at the National Manufactory of Sevres in France. Um, and as an artist in residence at the Alberta College of Art and Design in Calgary, he completed exhibitions there and in Santa Fe, New Mexico. He has returned to France numerous times uh, as a fellow of the Camargo Foundation in Cassis and as a fellow of the Brown Foundation in Minerbe, uh, which led to several exhibitions in France, 
He is an elected member of the International Academy of Ceramics, which presents contemporary ceramics at its highest level, including fewer than 80 American ar artists. And Brian uh, also began teaching ceramics at SMU in the fall of 2011. In 2012, he was awarded a Meadows Faculty Development Grant and a University Research Council Grant for continued research on marbled clay in France. Um, recent exhibitions include Monde Ceramique in Aubagne, France, uh, Craft Texas at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft, Les Fontaines uh, in Beaumont, France, and Beyond the Brickyard uh, at Archie Bray Foundation. And as you can see, Brian's work um, deals not only with this um, kind of uh, uh, beautiful marbling in ceramics, but um, also tends to take on a, a, a more conceptual uh, framework and is, tends to be um, inspired by uh, minimalism and installation. So with that as a way of introduction to our panelists, I invite you all to come and join me on the stage and we can talk a little bit more about your work and return to Earth. Well, welcome. Thank you all for joining me um, on this uh, auspicious day and celebrating. And of course, at the end of our, uh, our, com our um, uh, lectures this morning, um, someone asked um, uh, the question about um, you know, this kind of divide between uh, uh, fired clay that we call ceramics and fired clay that we call sculpture. And we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. What I what I first like to start off with is now that you've 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 had a, an opportunity to see the exhibition, um, you may have been familiar with some of the works of art in the exhibition, and perhaps some of these are new to you. But I'm curious about your uh, impressions um, from uh, the works of art that are on view in Return to Earth. Nicole, do you, did anything in particular strike you? Um, it was, I mean, I walked in and. My first thought was like, you know, I'm here. Can I um, but, <laughs> um, it was really amazing to see all these artists that I've looked at through the years and come back to over and over again together, um, and just seeing how they use the materials. Um, and just it was such. Um, there's this ability to keep the material sort of wet and moist in the in this way that clay gets very static and heavy. Um, yeah. And I think because they had to expand and visual so many other materials, when they came to this, they were taking sort of all that energy and putting it into the work without being sort of caught up in the technical mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. um, and they also had support that they could make whatever they wanted if someone would help them make it. So, um, but that was one thing that just um, I kept coming back to. And also this sense of um, kind of glazed and unglazed and how clay really is like seeing itself as a material, um, not just something that glaze goes on, um, and sort of this balance between the two. Yeah. Really kind of, yeah. yeah. I mean, your work obviously is is um, uh, incorporates a number of different media and tends to um, use ceramics in um, a, a broader kind of uh, uh, practice of assemblage. Um, uh, and I wonder if. You know the the kind of works like you know, Miro's works, which are all essentially assemblages of, of various aspects of ceramics, or um, uh, you know, any of uh, say Picasso's, which takes uh, um, elements of the cer ceramic tradition and, and um, transforms it for his own purposes. Did uh, those kinds of things resonate with you? Yeah, and I was like, even just to go back to the top, like, I heard they were in the right and the blue they just went mm -hmm. right back in with their school and took the blue away. Yeah. You know, and just those moments that are so sort of like, um, it creates an exception material and it creates a completely different conversation because it's kind of this, um, not considering it a whole, mm -hmm. um, that I think really makes it sort of pushes into the realm of the culture of the Yeah, yeah. Um, Ginger, your work incorporates a, quite a bit of art history um, and um, often oh, uh, <laughs> often uh, um, often works by Picasso, like the Demoiselle d'Avignon and the, and the vacuum cleaner. And so 
you know, is it, I'm, I'm curious your reaction to, you know, Picasso's ceramics in particular. Oh, I, I just love his ceramics. I mean, this is a case where Picasso's just having fun, yeah. seems to me, and he was very prolific with it. And um, I kind of stand there and wonder, and at look, looking at how he'll just take a little swipe of the brush, you know, only once. And often in ceramics, it's so belabored when you're trying to glaze something. You have to go over that and over it to get it, the color up to the where you want it. But Picasso just had fun with it. And of course, he had a you know an army of assistants who could throw pots and give him a bunch of wet pots to tear up and stick together, and had no worry whatsoever about wasting it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there's I mean, a certain the, freedom that comes with uh, yeah, having an, an with army of assistants like, who know yeah. what they're doing. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> but there's always been this sort of preciousness ar around ceramics, and all of these artists seem to sort of just thumb their nose at that. And I, I really like that, even though I use this real prissy porcelain that <laughs> <laughs> has all sorts of aristocracy connotations to it. But I love the paradox of it because it's um, very prone to flaws and stuff. And I see a lot of these artists kind of celebrating the, you know, the impure technicalities of clay rather than striving for that perfectionism that gets everybody so anal compulsive about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, Brian, I, I'll, I, Brian and I had lunch um, last week and so talked about some of these things initially and, um, um, I guess I, I shouldn't I shouldn't be surprised to learn that um, um, that Noguchi was um, one of the artists whose ceramics had had an impact on you in, in, in your work when we were starting to um, study ceramics. Right. I uh, I actually haven't had a chance to see the show except just a drive by, and uh, I think that so far the only thing that I've been able to to, to call from that is uh, uh, impressed with some of the scale because I did look at the catalog um, yeah. and you know I read the catalog and uh, uh, was very impressed with the, the essays by the by the authors. Um, but in, you know, you're, you're, one of the things we talked about was this, was a sense of uh, what kind of legacy this, this show might have, and you mentioned this morning. Uh, how Picasso and, and, and Miro had some, uh, some impact on Price and Volkus. Um, I think for me and some, some of the people that I, uh, that I, that I work with, um, the, the, leg, the most sort of obvious legacy is, is, is Noguchi because of the people, even, even though I think, um, as uh, Catherine mentioned, that compared to Picasso, there, isn't that, there aren't that many Noguchi uh, ceramics. Um, but he had a, an immediate, pretty uh, strong impact in, in Japan uh, with his ceramics on people like Yagi and uh, Hayashi and, and, and folks uh, to this day, um, people working in the United States like um, Inazuka, uh, people working in Japan like um, uh, Yoshihara. Um, and so, and, and when I was a student, um, it was probably first to uh, of the people in the show. It was probably first to to Noguchi that that, that I looked, uh, uh, and that might have to do with um, some of the legacy of the people that, that I worked with, uh, that, that they were connected to uh, directly or indirectly to influences of uh, the Sudesha movement uh, uh, in Japan after the war. This um, this. I think it means something like crawling through mud association. Mm -hmm. um, so ceramists who were uh, uh, who were working, perhaps in, in contrast to the kind of um, minge uh, uh, pottery movement um, that was also very very strong and remains very strong in, in Japan. These folks that were uh, not strictly making uh, anonymous or or purportedly anonymous folk pots, but folks that were making these very distinct uh, objects and ceramics that, to my eye, are still very connected to, to a, a, vessel, a vessel tradition. Yeah, I, th I thought, um, you know, Catherine's, um, she quoted a, a one of the 
criticisms of, uh, uh, of Noguchi um, that the Japanese had is that you know, he's, he's using our language, but inarticulately. Um, look, is, uh, you know, is, is an interesting thing because so many of these artists you know, were, were not part of the ceramic tradition. And that, of course, gave them a certain amount of freedom. Um, and, but it's that, it's that kind of conversation between um, uh, trying to do something new and different and also having a conversation with the ceramic tradition that I'm sure all of you, um, you know, engage with in, in, in one way or another. Um, and I'm curious about how, how you all perceive that kind of conversation happening today. Nicole, do you want to have? Um, sort of, can you rephrase? Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, so the, you know, the, this, you know, all of your, your, your work, I would say that all of your work is, um, is kind of, is, is non-traditional in terms of ceramics and that they're, they're, um, they're not, um, they're certainly not utilitarian um, and they are, um, you know, they um, are, um, art objects, very clearly art objects, and often, um, uh, often engage in um, part of the, the broader kind of artistic discourse beyond the ceramic tradition, but it, yet, it, it, you know, at times you can't, because of the material that you're working with, you can't really escape um, the conversation with the ceramic tradition, and oftentimes you refer directly to um, traditional and antique uh, forms in your work. Um, and so I, I, what, I'm, what I'm curious about is, you know, how, do you, how do you perceive your work in conversation with that ceramic tradition? Um, I, I guess I think of my work very much invoking the history of clay. Um, and I feel like if I'm going to use the material, it's going to be inherently present, so it has to be part of the discourse. Mm -hmm. um, however, there's the big divide between art and craft. Right. Um, so it's almost like I feel like I'm engaging the history of ceramics, but not necessarily the history of craft. And I think there's two very different conversations. Mm -hmm. um, but I do feel like even every material I use, I mean, I guess I go back to kind of like a process artist in the way that every material has a meaning. And so why would you use it if um, you're not sort of in discussion of it or showing what that material is? Right. Um, so I guess, does that answer the question? Sort yeah, of? I mean, yeah. Uh, uh -huh. you know, the, yeah. the, we were talking. It's a tough question. Uh, yeah, I know, I know, it's a big question. <laughs> and, and so, but we were talking, in, in, during the break, yeah. Nicole and I were talking about, she asked me, you know, she asked me because I've, I've, I kind of inter interchanged the terms um, uh, ceramics, and fired clay, um, and so she asked me, "What's you know, what's the difference between ceramics and 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 fired clay?" And you know, honestly, I, um, I, it, my my response was, "I, I think it's it's the kind of um, there there are words that um, um, that have uh, a history of their own and come with." certain connotations and cultural baggage, and ceramics is one of those words um, because of, of, of the association with craft. And so even when it's used in kind of like in, in um, what we would say a, a more uh, in, in the context of, um, of um, um, contemporary art, um, there, there's still that, um, that there's still that question, there's still that divide, you know, and, and is it just because of the terminology? Do, we, do I use the word fired clay to not suggest the ceramic tradition, to kind of avoid that? And um, I don't really know, but that's, that, that's one of the topics that we want to cover today. I um, think the, the difference between ceramic and fired clay is the difference between oil on canvas and pigment carried in oil dried on canvas. It's, it's, uh, it's right. kind, of, kind of a redundancy. Uh, right, right. And once it's fired, it's no longer clay. So you have clay or you have ceramic. You can't really have them both. Right, right. And I, I also, you know, the, 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 the subject of 
what is, you know, why call it ceramic sculpture? Why isn't it just sculpture? You know. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> um, you know. So, uh. so, so let's let's talk about this thing that drives that drives us crazy <laughs> a little bit. You know, that we we have these objects that are clearly, um, you know, works of art, and we have things that we refer to we, that we refer to as utilitarian, but oftentimes are 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 you know incredibly beautiful and. Uh, objects that um, are, have, can have broad references um, beyond themselves and beyond their utilitarian use. Um, so, I mean, do you, I, I'm kind of curious. I mean, do you run into this with your own work? You know, this kind of, um, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, high art craft divide. I mean, does, is it something that that you know that do you feel like you you know get pigeonholed in one or the other, and is it? I mean, I think that um, in some ways you choose your audience. Yeah. So that gives you the artist sort of the um, sort of position to put it into the context that you want to have, the conversation you want to have. Mm -hmm. um, but as an artist, I do, I get called a ceramicist every once in a while. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I feel like my work's clearly sculpture. And, um, right. and it is something that, it's almost this, term or this way of this material that people can't necessarily um, break away from, no matter how mm -hmm. you're using it. It always sort of goes back into a conversation of it, um, which I think over the years I've tried to use um, and very much put that sort of more into the, the conversation of the work I'm making within the audience I'm making it for. Um, but it is something that's, like it's just confusing like when you get a review and they talk about the ceramicist, Nicole Cherubini, when it's the reviews not coming out in a ceramic journal. Like, you know, right, right, like right. it's just confusing why this material always is um, connected with this word, no matter how you use it. Sure. Yeah. Unless you don't fire it. That's the one time it's sort of, <laughs> yeah, like Rebecca Warren. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, the, the divisions, I mean, it's, it's, it sounds like oftentimes the divisions are, um, are really splitting hairs. I mean, one of the mm -hmm. things that's happened over the, past 60 some 60 years some odd years now since you know these works of art were made and and of course you have artists who are, are you know are are um, not necessarily trained in ceramics in any way Fontana was a little bit and and certainly Milotti was um, but for Picasso Miro and, and, and Noguchi I mean they're 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 coming at it from a very different perspective um, and uh, and so they're 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 not coming at it from you know the the kind of artisanal uh, world of, of ceramics are coming at it from um, the world of, of you know the avant garde and so there's a certain freedom that they have with it um, and I think that freedom is passed through to the successive generations um, you know I mentioned it before like Peter Volkos and Ken Price and then now I mean artists today obviously feel completely comfortable to use whatever kind of material they want that best suits what they are trying to do. Um, but at the same time, even though there is that freedom, there is still this kind of there's still this kind of battle about perception. Um, and uh, I mean, you know, um, I'm I'm curious because you know, Ginger, you work in, in porcelain, which has a, a very specific history, which you are specifically drawing upon in, in, in using porcelain. Um, you know, do how do you how do you perceive of your own work? Um, and is is the divide even relevant anymore? I don't I don't know that it's not relevant in general. It's not so much to me. Yeah. Um, I can't tell you how many times well-meaning friends have said, "I know a little put your stuff in," and I'm thinking, <laughs> "Gee, thanks." Um, but I mean, you know, we all kind of grew up with all that, with ceramics by you and that sort of stuff where you go and you receive a bisque form and you paint some stupid thing on it, you know. Mm -hmm. But, um, <laughs> and the craft fairs where that's sitting next to the crocheted toilet paper holders. <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, no wonder ceramics gets a bad name. And, there, you know, there'll be 15 of those. And I think that part of the difference is a lot of artists doing clay sculpture aren't doing these multiples. And we forget that. And people don't understand the process of ceramics, by and large. I mean, maybe a lot of you are clay artists, but 
I think a lot of people don't understand just what goes into it. They think it's highly technical and um, kind of scary, and God, the whole thing comes out breakable. So that scares off collectors who don't want to deal with that. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of layers of little funny things about ceramics, but I think mostly it's a it's a matter of words, the vocabulary. I mean, maybe in French or something, they've got better words that make these divisions between clay and ceramics and whatnot. Right. I don't know. I um, wish I could speak it and I could tell you that, but um, I don't know. I, I don't feel the divide is that severe anymore. Yeah. I, I've always felt, though, intimidated by kind of the world of potters who have a real strong craft, craft ethic and because every now and then I have to cheat, you know, and use something like glue. <laughs> really bad. As another sculptor pointed out to me, well, somebody's not trying to eat off of this thing, so, you know, it doesn't matter. And there are certain limits in the technique where you can't get certain colors, simply can't get them at a high fire yeah. glaze. I wish I could get a hot pink or a maroon. <laughs> Yeah. But by golly, I'm going to have to cheat and use a little bit of acrylic to heighten that, to make those pomegranates pop, you know? <laughs> and I finally just came to, oh, well, just do it. <laughs> so, yeah. Mm. And, you know, Brian, you, you, you've spent time in, within um, the ceramic community, particularly in the south of France, and um, that, you know, <clears throat> Picasso, um, at least at the time, certainly helped to revive in, in, in uh, Valeries. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm and I'm I'm curious about your experience there, and 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 you know, is is this a conversation that the that the artists who you 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 met in the south of France have as well? I guess I found that my, yeah, my experience in, in France was was different. Um, maybe what struck me the most is that uh, in in you, you certainly do have decorative art museums, very important ones in France, but at the same time they're uh, Ordinary art museums uh, will, I, in my experience, much more frequently than in, in, the, in the U.S., will exhibit ceramics next to the next to the paintings, and the collections are all are all mixed together. Um, I, I, you know, I appreciated in your in your in your preface of this, idea, this the, the word discarded. The artists have just kind of discarded these these uh, distinctions, and I'm you know I'm. Very comfortable with with that. Um, I mean, I think I, th there there are there are folks who who, who will want to pursue those conversations. And there was a um, a symposium last year at uh, the Cardiff School of Art about uh, ceramics and sculpture, uh, different disciplines, shared concerns. So th I mean, that material is out there on the web if folks want to uh, pursue mm -hmm. pursue those distinctions. But I. Um, you know, I'm I'm more inclined to what you wrote about Moreau, for, for whom uh, there there weren't these distinctions. There was just art making, and I feel that's a, a more comfortable place. So whether it's artist, potter, ceramist, and one th one thing though, uh, a word that that does stick in my craw is ceramicist. None of us are ceramicists. <laughs> a ceramicist is a historian of ceramics, uh, not a maker of ceramics. So right. that, that one should be left to the art historians. That's what they do. <laughs> um, is it, um, I mean, your, your work is, is, um, is engages in, in kind of, um, um, a, a much more kind of contemporary conceptual uh, framework. Um, the, it, it, talk a little bit about the, the piece of the arrows. Right. Um, so that's, uh, it's called uh, Criminal Centennial. And it's, um, it's for the centenary of uh, Adolf Loos, um Ornament and Crime, which was is, which is first published in 1913, um, in, in which uh, uh, Los um, talks a little bit about about um, mark making and ornamentation, and how uh, uh, 
the, the, the first marks that we made uh, were erotic in origin. Uh, and that one of the very first erotic marks was the cross. Um, but and that for, for, uh, for Losis, for his time, for, for kind of art, this Art Nouveau period in 1913, uh, to, in his opinion, to continue doing that was degenerate and criminal. To, like, like tattooing, he, he saw this as a, as a degenerate practice. Um, and I don't know if it's really so much what Loos did, but the way he was perceived since then, especially like people like Corbusier, who, 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 who picked up on, on some ideas that were, were in that article, uh, the so-called um, elimination of ornamentation. But in fact, Loos uh, had extremely ornamented buildings because his, his material of choice was marble, uh, which is this highly decorative material. So uh, that's why I chose to mark that, mark that anniversary with his favorite ornament. <laughs> What's the scale of those arrows? Well, I think it's, it's about three feet wide. So the arrows are 14 inches or so. Um, there, uh, the fact that um, you know your um, your work is um, is tends to be a, a bit more conceptual in nature puts it in uh, uh, a category. I think for most people that would say is separate from the uh, the kind of more utilitarian ceramic tradition. But do, is there still a bit of uh, that uh, well, I I started uh, making ceramics uh, to to make pots, mm -hmm. um, in part because I had been making I'd been making books um, as a, as a printer, so I had to receive text, I just you know designed or worked on a, on a book, um, and I wanted to make containers that didn't have as say as specific a text. And I was also working um, as a baker, so I uh, uh, wanted to, you know, make make pots that would present these things that I was baking. One of the things that I learned uh, working in France was that there's this saying that uh, pastry is a division of architecture, but that in <laughs> But that in France, in France, architecture is a division of pastry. <laughs> so th that was uh, that Much was like clay. You're wedging and rolling, and well, it's all it's baking. All, whether it's <laughs> making paper for making books and, and printing ink and, and bread dough and, and pastry cream. It's all about muck. Yeah. Uh, so that was an attraction for uh, for working in ceramics. But uh, I mean, some of the things that that you showed. Um, these are these are more tile works that are more related to to architecture than they are to pots. But um, I, I always have to think about the idea of, of what constitutes something as conceptual because I I don't know of anything more conceptual than a pot mm -hmm. uh, as as this extension of the body, a replacement for for a body part. Um, and that, that also uh, is kind of foundational for, for uh, social interaction, that, that, that we would use an object to, to drink from rather than dunking our heads in the stream. This was, so I, I think of them all as, um, you know, whether it's a so-called utilitarian pot or, or uh, architectural ceramics or, or ceramics that are sort of inspired by the history of ceramics, or, um, they, they all have, uh, I think, very powerful conceptual foundations. Yeah. Sarah, um, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting is the kind of uh, persistence of clay. I mean, clay is <laughs> one of the earliest um, materials with which we may have made works of art from, you know, prehistoric figurines um, uh, to the present day. And it still seems to hold such a broad fascination for artists. Um, and for many of the artists in, in the Return to Earth exhibition, there was something about um, the physicality of clay, also its, its metaphorical associations, um, and, and um, the kind of ease 
of manipulating the material. And I wonder if, you know, it, since you all have chosen to work with this particular material, what, you know, what, what was it that drew you to it in the first place? Nicole? It's funny to think about yeah. the ease to work with it because it's such a hard material to work with. Um, and to actually get the freedom that you see out there is so incredibly hard. Um, but, I mean, I always loved clay. Ever since I was little, I remember when I grew up in the city and then when we moved to the suburbs for a little bit and I spent all my time making mud pies. Mm -hmm. um, so there's always just something <laughs> about the process of the material and just I love the fact that it records... Um, it records every moment. You know, there's something about it, like it, it keeps a finger mark, or sometimes I find like my ring marks in it, or um, like different clays record differently, like the terracotta, you won't get as much finger marks because there's more grog and earthenware or porcelain, you know, so there's um, something just about the, the presence of the material mm -hmm. that I find absolutely wonderful to work with. Um, and the other thing that I love about it is um, this line that kind of was talked about a lot this morning of um, the space between two dimensions and three dimensions, that you actually are dealing with form um, and working in physical space, and then you have to go back and address surface. Um, and so it's kind of like I have incredible painter envy. Like I sometimes think, like I can talk about the um, historical ceramic references, but it's really like I think so much about painting. Um, and so it's this, this material that you can fully bring these two together. And, um, and even historically, when you look at it, you understand history by seeing both, both of sort of the, the 3D and the 2D kind of brought together in these single moments. Yeah. Um, so I think, in a way, that becomes even more and more my interest in the material. It, you know, uh, I'll, uh, just to, to add to that, Miro, um, Moreau actually learned to draw by uh, modeling clay with his eyes closed. It was the way his drawing teacher was trying to teach him how to draw. Hmm. And so, um, uh, you know, the association with um, uh, something that is in incredibly tactile and uh, was, was, you know, kind of the essential art experience for him. Um, and so, um, he he recalled that in an interview about the ceramics. So, and then having that relationship between the kind of pictorial process of drawing and the physicality of shaping something with your hand, um, I think is a, an, an interesting way to think about that connection that, that you're making as well. And then the other thing is just, I mean, it's just beautiful. You know, yeah. like, I mean, you can't sort of escape <laughs> that. Like, you take something out of the kiln and you have this drip of glaze and you can just, like, be lost in it. You yeah. know, the colors you can get and by putting one glaze over another and kind of the magic of it even. You yeah. know, even yeah. though like that magic is really controlled by all of us, it, you know, it's you're still there, yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, Ginger, is it was, you know, what was it about clay that, and, and specifically porcelain that you really, that really drew you to it? Well, I guess it'd have to be just the sensuality of the material. You come back to that and um, it just, you just lose it when you get your hands in this stuff. Mm -hmm. It's so soft and so malleable. And you know, you only have a certain amount of time to play with it before it starts to crack and break and dry out. Moisture is very important as controlling that. But um, I, I, it wasn't because, it wasn't when I started with it, but later I realized that clay is kind of a, I don't know, it's, it's in some ways a, subversive material, I think. I think artists come back to clay in times of real social stress. I think probably you trace this with all these artists after World War II. Yeah. It wasn't just that it was a cheap material, which it is cons comparatively, but also it does make a person return to the earth. Even porcelain, which is made by a, a kind of a recipe of natural materials, not just you know, pulled out of a creek bed somewhere or whatever. But I mean, all clay is filtered that we use and has some, you know, technical uh, processes that it goes through. But there is something very primal about sticking your hands in the, in the clay and molding it. And then, I mean, I could give you a whole, you know, weird spiritual thing about the transformation from the clay body to the fired piece because it is a transformation that most materials simply don't go through. And it's, um, I think, 
in theological terms, a very ontological process, a process of something, of being, of being present. And it's also very incarnational in that it's about matter, very much about matter. And it's, it's matter that's dug out of the earth kind of matter. Thus, it um, has this human appeal that a lot of materials simply don't have. Now, that can be really romanticized and taken the wrong way. And I think every potter knows that, too. But um, even so, it, it, it returns in this cycle, it seems like. that Here we are in this digital age, you know, and so many people are making art, you know, with a computer. And I, when I first tried that, it felt like you were using a baked potato, you know, to <laughs> draw with. And I kind of gave up on that whole the kind of deal, but um, with clay, you, you know, you, you do it and you get something. And then by golly, you fire it and all your wonderful intentions are gone because the <laughs> thing is slumped or cracked or broken or you can't get the color you want. And there is that, um, yeah, you think you're the one in control, but oh no, once again, you are not. <laughs> and with my stuff, it ended up becoming very narrative and I've combined painting and the sculpture and writing in, uh, in the pieces I do. And the narrative often picks up on these flaws that occur in the firing that probably I should throw out you know, and start over. But I'm too lazy because I've already done it, took all that time. I'm going to get a story to make this thing hang together, by golly. You know? yeah. <laughs> so I don't have to waste it all, or else you make shards and get into mosaics. Which is always a good thing, too. Yeah. Um, but anyway, really, I do think clay has this kind of subversive element that's a very interesting thing about it, more than a lot of other materials. Yeah. Brian, you know, you, you were a pastry chef. And... <laughs> yes, yeah, so, my, you know, my interest, my initial interest, uh, you know, how, how I got into it was, was uh, ceramics connection to food and drink. Um, but... Uh, if I can try to pick up on some of the things that Nicole and Ginger were saying, um, you know, this ontology um, and, and bringing something in, into being makes me think of the of the of the poetry of of that kind of uh, of that kind of creation. That it, I guess, for me, it is in a way more linked to a poetry than to a practice because there is this there's this thing that we bring into being, and and it initially sometimes it's it's. Uh, there is there is an immediacy to its to its presence, and I think that's something that's um, celebrated maybe more in, in ceramics than in, in painting. I'm not really sure why, um, but you know there isn't maybe a paintbrush. There's just just a hand making these marks. But I also so I think that that's an attraction. But I also think that immediacy is um, is maybe overrated in in ceramics because. Uh, you know, as Ginger's saying, there's actually a very elaborate process and, and really great mediation through which the, the, the clay goes to become ceramic. So uh, at, at the one time, there's something very close to, to the maker, and then it's, it's, but also it's, it's very distant, very risky, um, and, and the final product, product is um, uh, not always uh, uh, Clear, and I'm thinking of the, some of the photographs that uh, in the Picasso that Bacon included with the Picasso uh, article. Uh, you know, he's he's painting the, the these dishes and, and and using the the fish bone to to, to make a, a print on his on his plate. And there's a certain immediacy to that, but at the same time, the colors that he's painting are not the colors that he's going to get out of kiln. Yeah. So there's, a, there's also this distance. Yeah, very important point. Yeah. I mean, uh, and color. Oh. That, you know, for Miro, that was great. I mean, he loved the fact that and color is incredibly important for Miro, but he loved the fact that he didn't know what he was going to get every time he put something in the in the kiln. Yeah. You know, he had a certain idea. They had like color charts of glazes, and, and so knowing what to mix to get particular colors. But at the same time, variations in the heat of the fire, variations in the the smoke that you know from the wood would change it, and um, he he kind of reveled in in, in that a, a element of chance. Um, Let's, let's look at this um, from a slightly different perspective. Um, you know, we, uh, why, is, why is it that, um, 
we can look at your works of art and say those are clearly works of art. And, um, but we can't um, look at um, a pot on um, a kitchen counter and think of that as a work of art if it's, if it's got something in it. Um, Nicole, your, your husband is also a, um, well, you said last night he's a potter. He's a potter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I, I'm, you know, I'm, and, and I'm, I'm sure that, you know, d does he think of what he, he does as, as art? Um, yes. Yeah, completely. And um, I always tell him that um, potters are sort of the dawn of social practice. And, um, <laughs> and also right. minimalism, because they sit down and they do the same thing over and over and over again, you know? Right, right, um, So right. they understand form in a way that just no one else does, you know? Yeah. Um, but, I mean, for him, it's a, it's a very confusing subject, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but I certainly know everyone who uses his like glasses or his cups or plates or whatever it gets such pleasure. Yeah. Um, like in the way that I can go look at a Fontana and just like get such pleasure, you know. Yeah. Um, and so it's that very it's that very um, interesting moment of when did art lose part of daily practice? You know, like when right. was the separation and why? Right. You know? And so many of the artists in, in this exhibition turned to ceramics because of those associations with daily life to try and strip away that division between art and life. Which is one of the wonderful things about working with clay is that you always have that space that you're coming back to. Yeah. I think just in a conceptual format, you know. Um, so, but it is, I mean, it is really, I mean, I think, I mean, this is a totally different conversation, but I don't know if it had to do with, like, um, academia and when it became the ceramic department, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to just a material that was used in the sculpture realm. Sure. Um, or when these ceramic departments started being potters and sculptors, and so they're in, within, the, within the program there was a divide. I don't know, like, yeah, I don't right. really know. I mean, we talk about it all the time, like, I mean, I remember meeting him and I was like, oh, he's a potter. And then, I, I mean, now I have utter respect and reverence for what he does, because it's something that I just, I can't sit down and make something that's going to give someone such intimate pleasure. Right, you right, know? yeah. And then, you know, Ginger, a lot of your works are, are, are you know, essentially um, porcelain replicas of very kind of commonplace utilitarian objects. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it, it has another relation between um, the commonplace and utilitarian and ceramics. Um, you know, it seems like you 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 do have that that same uh, a similar kind of um, you're thinking about those commonplace things around us in in a, in a much uh, more um, uh, uh, kind of a complete way um, mm -hmm. and look and looking at those things um, artistically with, with with a certain amount of of reverence and wit. Um, I mean, well, do you, yeah, you, the. I've always been an advocate of trying to find the, the holy in the common, for instance. And um, because we just live in the ordinary world we live in, whatever it happens to be, what century we're plopped down in, you know, there are things around us. And some of these things are absolutely transcendent. And that might be a, a beautiful Japanese teacup or a beautifully made vase that has as much punch to it as, um, you know, an incredible brancusi up here or something. Mostly that doesn't happen. But there again, you're not going to have these mountaintop experience every day, all day long, or you're not going to have them at all. <laughs> and so the other, all the other stuff in our lives um, can actually be fraught with meaning if, if we just know to look for it. And some of, sometimes that meaning is what keeps you going when um, everything is so bad that nothing nothing else works. You can get that kind of dialogue going with a rug on the floor <laughs> or a light bulb or, or what have you and, and find sustenance to keep living. I mean, I think art just makes us know our humanity and know that we're alive at, in times when the whole world is saying otherwise. Um, so yeah, I'm really crazy about domestic objects and I really love good design. And 
even if it's, you know, cheap stuff. I think one of the most wonderful things is when Target came out with, uh, you know, stuff by Michael Graves and, <laughs> and all that. It made it more accessible to just people like us who have to shop at Target. But um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and Brian, um, you know, you were talking about, you know, you think of every, you know, any kind of ceramic object as a pot and, and that kind of the more kind of poetic or metaphorical associations of that with as an extension of the body or, um, you know, to, to use Nicole's analogy, um, you know, the, the kind of ultimate social practice, you know, <laughs> uh, 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 or uh, relational art as it's sometimes called. Um, so, I mean, you clearly find something, you know, um, uh, transcendent and artistic in, in those kinds of commonplace things as well. I, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure what, what the hang up is. Yeah. Um, I'm very happy to appreciate pottery as art. I, I, I don't know what the issue is. And I, I like, Nicole, you said the, the dawn of social practice. Because when I first heard that, I thought you meant like the, the Don Corleone of, of social practice. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's sort of the godfather of social practice, but it's also the sunrise of social practice. It's kind of both, <laughs> both those things. Um, both ways. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and actually, that reminds me of one of the, one of the lines from the catalog, uh, again, about Picasso that Dakin Hart wrote, that a pot, for Picasso, a pot is an ideal vehicle for violating the conventions about where and how art sits in life. Um, and I think, uh, uh, you know, when I read that, I thought, oh, I guess that's, that may be why I, I made pots, because it makes a lot of sense to me that uh, there is there's an, there's an interaction with, with them, uh, uh, but they remain, uh, you know, when, when, when well made and well considered, uh, uh, extremely artful objects. So uh, I think that's, that's, that's been a big part of their appeal for me. Yeah. Um. Why don't we go ahead and include the audience now, and we can open it up for questions to uh, any any of our panelists. Yes. Um, with all sorts of friends, just look for the response. Uh, I've always felt in these days about good design. Design is, is what it's all about. I've always thought that the term is good design and good art are synonymous, that um, design is a continuum of artistic expression. This building is art. The garden is art. And they all interplay with one another. Um, when it comes to clay, uh, it's interesting to me how many uh, how much of the curatorial um, population, if you will, uh, find it necessary to uh, define art as one thing and clay as something else. Uh, museums, for the most part, um, short change things like clay. MoMA is probably one of the few museums that looks at design uh, as the key, whether it is flatware or a car or a painting. They don't differentiate. However, uh, other museums uh, will classify clay as a uh, that's the decorative box, <laughs> right? Whatever that means. Right. Um, so, is it the problem not amongst the the, the viewers of the uh, of the objects, but of the the curatorial community 
that won't embrace the notion of clay being truly art or other things beyond clay. Sure. I mean, I, you know, um, museums and art historians were invented to um, kind of define and categorize, and, and, uh, and, and, and that's what we do. Um, at the same time, it's not always to the benefit of understanding. Um, because those those kinds of um, uh, definitions and divisions that um, uh, are arrived upon, um, you know, they they are based on um, interpretation of existing information, which, you know, and and also um, you know whatever you know the current um, thinking is on those kinds of things. So, um, you know, there 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 are limitations. Um, to uh, a museum and to art history. And it's a different kind of practice than it is for a viewer who, um, or an artist. Um, and, uh, you know, at the same time, I think that, you know, my colleagues who are curators of decorative arts would say that um, uh, those objects are not being denigrated by putting in the decorative arts collection. Um, but um, there is also the other um, fact that is, is one can say is, is generally is that um, um, museums and academia tend to be um, at least one, if not a, a few steps behind the artists um, and a lot of the viewing public. And because academia and museums are another form of, of academia, um, are, are slightly more rigid. Um, uh, and, 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 and because part of their project is to, um, because part of their project is to define, they're, they're less um, apt to make changes to those definitions quickly. Um, and that's, you know, at the same time, you know, part of the reason for doing this particular exhibition um, is to, uh, to really reconsider that entire notion um, and, and to question why we call one thing uh, made of uh, clay sculpture and why we call another thing decorative arts. Um, and was also really the basis for my last question and kind of turning the tables and you know, um, why is it that when we why can't we consider a, um, you know, a pot that's used for something as um, a meaningful uh, work of art? Um, so, I don't know, that's my answer to that question. <laughs> kind of long-winded answer to that question. Uh, yes, sir. Well, the question keeps coming down. Yeah. Why is something a practical object while something else is a work of art? So imagine this. Uh, cataclysm occurs, earthquakes, volcanoes, only three things survive. A pottery barn, a china shop, and a target, which was rich. <laughs> I guarantee that all of these things are immediately put in the museums. Right. And this is a high art. So my answer to your question is that the difference between the practical object and the work of art is several million. <laughs> <laughs> That's powerful. <laughs> yes. Uh, so many ideas roaming around. There are certain constants and there are certain variables, and it seems like they reflect um, the, the variables reflect culture, reflect the times, and a decision is made on you know what words you're going to use and what they mean, which kind of puts a burden of education on the people who are making these choices. You know, like saying, okay, in this era, I'm going to use this word to mean this. And you could be talking about focus, intent, material, science, you know, a craft, art. It depends how you want to put those together. So you can, you know, if, if somebody in the last century, the century before, were having this exact discussion, um, it would be interesting to, to see what words they use. 
words represent culture, <coughs> intent, in a lot of ways. That's what I'm hearing some of these elements we're talking about. Um, I mean, I, I, th I think a lot of these kinds of questions about terminology and, um, and perception, um, you know, s center around what is um, essentially the, the kind of degradation of, of academic distinctions. And um, because, you know, um, from, say, the uh, 1800s to about 19, Oh, 60 or something, you know, art, um, art was um, taught in, in essentially a, in, um, uh, an apprenticeship in academic mode. And so when you were training as an artist, you were either training as a painter or a draftsperson or, you know, a potter. Um, and and um, many, you know, university art programs were set up the same way. And that's starting to change. And so, and, and I think it's changing in, in response to the way that art is that artists are making art, um, and they're, 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 um, they're not making art with those kinds of very rigid distinctions, um, which I think is, is, is fascinating and part of this kind of um, series of exhibitions, that, you know, cut these couple exhibitions that we've had of the, the Ken Price retrospective, um, and then now the, the Return to Earth exhibition, follow, kind of traces uh, that history back to when it starts to, um, uh, kind of loosen up um, quite a bit. Well, I think of uh, Noguchi and uh, Catherine talking about his ambivalence to its fluidity. Um, and that's something that I think is both a part of the, the material, the clay, but also, uh, you know, the discipline of, of ceramics, um, that it, it, you know, back and forth, uh, it sometimes is, you know, going into a decorative arts collection, sometimes it's not. Um, it, we've talked about how uh, ceramics can, can have this, uh, can play this subversive role within those categories, so, but there, there have to be categories to subvert if there's gonna be any, um, <laughs> continued subversion. So uh, I, I feel like I work in a category of ceramics, um, but I think that that, that category is, um, is uh, the perception of that category is, is greatly varied. Uh, and, and mine, I, I have a particular uh, view of that category with which I'm, I'm, I'm very happy, but then uh, you know, other, others, others uh, may not be. Um, uh, but you know, I just I just go back to to Moreau's idea of well, there's there's art making, and and um, that's I'm, I'm I'm I think a lot of us are are, are are more about about that artists are and um, categorization uh, is maybe for for some others. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Nicole. Are the forms that you use, like frames around your uh, work, are those clay or are those wood pieces? Those are wood. Okay. Because I'm thinking, hi. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, thank you. Oh. They would never do that. Yeah. <laughs> it would balk. Why don't, why don't, uh, yes, sir, in the back. Nicole, have, have you tried to produce those in ceramic? Um, I mean, the wall pieces, the boxes, are long, flat slabs. Um, but I never really have, because I, I go back to why would I? You know, like, I mean, wood does perfectly for it, you know? Um, and I really like the combination just sort of of the wood and clay and sort of challenging, like, object support um, and, like, the history of how the clay usually sits on the pedestal, so what happened when everything gets all turned upside down. So, no, I haven't. <laughs> Why don't we uh, uh, maybe continue this conversation um, a little more casually uh, with a glass of wine in our hands, perhaps. I um, want to thank you all for coming and being with us today.